Today, we will be looking into the curious case of Elizabeth Wettlaufer, who many call the Angel of Death, and others will call the worst serial killer in Canadian history. Elizabeth was born June 10, 1967, in a rural town southwest of Toronto, Ontario, named Woodstock. She grew up in a very religious household and would go on to get a bachelor's degree in religious education counseling from London Baptist Bible College in London, Ontario. Later, in the mid-1980s, she would study nursing at Conestoga College, not too far from her hometown in Ontario. Wetlaufer would then work at Crescent Care, a long-term care home in Woodstock. She was initially regarded as a caring and professional individual, but quickly that changed. Throughout her years there, she would struggle with substance abuse as well as alcoholism. She faced multiple accusations of showing up to work drunk, and in one instance was found passed out in the facility's basin during a night shift. She was subsequently fired in March 2014 over a serious incident in which she gave the wrong medication to a patient. After leaving Crescent Care, Wetlaufer would jump from job to job, but was eventually hired by Meadow Park Care Center in London, Ontario. She would later lose this job when she checked herself into a rehab center. She would continue her nursing career after this stint in rehab by taking many temp jobs at other care homes. In 2016, Elizabeth entered an inpatient drug rehab program at the CAMH in Toronto. At that rehab facility, Elizabeth would tell doctors all about her dark past and the wake she left in the lives of many. And that brings us here. The police have brought Elizabeth in for an interrogation. After getting her some fast food and letting her eat in peace, the investigators enter the room to start the interrogation. Sorry about that. That's okay. There's too many people moving and shaking around here. They can't really keep track of who's doing what. So, um, so yeah, like I said, um, I'm, I'm just going to go through for... Everything in this room is audio and video recorded, first right. off. Are you okay, okay with that? Oh, yes. Okay. So I just want to go through, like I said, a couple formalities, cover a few little things off, things that I have to do on my end that I, I, I right. need to do, and uh, things that I just want to tell you and make sure that we're all on the same page before we uh, before we get going. Okay. Okay? So, first off, um, today is Wednesday, October the 5th, 2016, and on my phone right now, I'll just use that as a, a time reference, it's 514. Okay. So 1714, we'll just use that as a start time of our conversation here today. Um, again, my name is Nathan Hergott with the Woodstock Police Service. I currently work in our crime unit. Okay. And uh, we met a short time ago in downtown Toronto, correct? Yes. Right. Yeah. So um, we came to a facility where you've spent the last uh, few weeks, from what I understand. Yeah. And uh, we met with Dr. Khan and, yes. and his team of uh, associates. Yeah. and. I believe you're under his care for the last little while, correct? Yeah, for the last three weeks. Okay. And uh, the process, how, how we got here basically is um, kind of offered you a ride back and, and so we could have this conversation and, and you gracefully accepted and uh, off we went down uh, the 401 or the, well, the, the gardener, the QW, yeah, and, the and the 403 and, 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 and here we are, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just to make it clear for whoever might watch this in the future, um, we didn't forced you to come with us, we didn't, uh, you know, shove you in the car and off we went kind of thing. You did it yeah. on your own free will and, and you accepted it on your own, uh, on your own decision making, yeah. is that no. correct? Yes, okay. I had a nap and he even let me try to give money to the homeless people. So. There you go, I remember all that, I remember all that. So I, I know I read you a few things before, um, as we were kind of just cruising down Spadina there, um, and I know you've been read this many times, but it's just things that we need to just reiterate and, and make sure that you're clear and comfortable with, okay. with having this conversation today. Okay. Okay. Um, like I said, um, based on our investigation, there could be some, some pretty serious criminal charges that result of, yeah. of our investigation. Okay. Yeah. So having said that, if, if you wish to speak to a lawyer at any time, okay. I don't want you to hesitate. Uh, we can make it happen whenever you like. So okay. whether it's now, five minutes from now, an hour from now, or three days from now, whatever the case may be, you we're just not going to be asking questions for three days, are we? I hope not. I hope <laughs> okay. I'm just I'm just saying that any time that you want to speak to a lawyer, that you're kind of in our company or whatever the case may be, you let us know and, and we can make that accommodation for okay. you. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Because you, in your position uh, as a Canadian citizen, you're uh, you're. 
entitled to have free legal advice from a legal aid, okay. uh, due to counsel, lawyer, a lawyer of your choice, whoever you like. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Okay. You may be charged uh, with many criminal offenses, um, and you don't have to say anything in answer to the charges that you face. But if you wish to do so, um, we're going to do that today. Um, but whatever you do say could be used in, in court. And I know we had that conversation in the car on the way, on the yeah. way uh, back to Woodstock. Yeah. And I asked you to repeat it in your own words, and you kind of gave us a few uh, a few of, of describing it in your own vocabulary. As you said something like, it's not Vegas. What happens in the car on the way back doesn't necessarily stay in the car. Right? Yeah. So okay. same thing same thing in this room. Anything that you okay. say and everything that we talked about should be used as evidence at court. Yeah. Okay? Okay. So kind of, to put it easily, the same rules apply. Okay. okay. Um, and if you, so just just for the record, and I know you you prefer to go by Beth is what you told yeah. us. Is that correct? Yeah. Can you just state your full name for me? Elizabeth Tracy May Wetwalfer. Tracy May. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And just spell your last name for the record. W e t t l a u f e r. Perfect. Um, and Beth, the reason why we're here today is because uh, we've received some information uh, back at the end of last week. With regards to um, some information that was provided to the Toronto Police Service, mm -hmm. um, which has led us into uh, quite a bit of work, and, and Lisa is here today to speak to you with regards to kind of how this all started and, and yeah. follow up. But basically, um, I've I've watched your statement that you provided to Toronto. Okay. Okay. And we've been provided uh, this document here. Does that look familiar to yeah. you? Yes. Okay. Right. All right, and from what I can see here, there's four pages of a uh, handwritten document. Is that your handwriting? Yes, it is. Okay, and it just kind of goes through um, some people that you've encountered in, in your career uh, from 2007 through to 2016 of August, yeah. uh, August of 2016. Okay, so so that's kind of the, the focus of our investigation right now is right. the information that you, you've put on these four pieces of paper. Yes. Okay. Um, but but before we get into that, I just want to kind of get an idea of, of your career and, and where you kind of where you've been in your career and um, kind of how you got into things. And registered nurse. I started from call. I started from with from uh, here in Park uh, Secondary School. I um, <clears throat> I graduated grade thirteen. Went for a year of law school. Not law school, sorry, journalism school. Okay. And uh, then uh, went to uh, Bible College, okay. uh, London Baptist Bible College in London. Graduated with a degree in uh, counseling, with a bachelor's degree in counseling. Mm -hmm. And then um, discovered that that's not going to be, wasn't really going to get me a lot as far as work wise and career wise and. So I went back to uh, here in Park High School for a year, and I took a year of math and sciences and went on to um, Conestoga College. And in, in, uh, they have it's in Kitchener, but they have Stratford campus. So I went there for the three years. Okay. And then when I graduated there, I worked in a place called Geraldton. Okay. Which is 16 hours north of, Sun of uh, Toronto. Like I said. Quite a bit north, isn't it? Three hours north of Thunder Bay. Yeah, that's way up there. Yeah. Um, worked there. Couldn't stand the isolation. Moved back. Worked for um, an organization called uh, Christian Horizons here in town in one of their group homes till 2007, um, at which time um, my marriage fell apart in February 2007. And... Uh, I met a woman online, okay. and she decided to move to be with me. Okay. So um, I ended up quitting the job I was at and going to correctional care to make a little bit more money because I was only pregnant earner. Mm -hmm. So I started working at correctional care. Um, I believe it was June 2007. Okay. And how long did you work there for? Until. Um, 2014. Yeah, till uh, like I think it was March 2014. And were you always in the same role? Or? 
as a, as a, role as a nursing care? Or? As a registered nurse. Yeah. And registered nurse's role is always the same. Yeah. But um, I worked in different areas of the home. Okay. There's five wings to corrective care, so I worked in different areas. Right. Okay. All throughout the, the seven or so years that you were there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And at that point, did you have different supervisors from unit to unit or... Uh, no, was there, there, was, the same person or? there was one supervisor, Helen Crombie, she was the head nurse. Okay. Um, and then from Crest Care, I know you've, you've had a few other... Yeah, I went from Crest and Care, fired from Crest and Care. Okay. For a, a medication area, era, okay. er, error. Yeah. Then from there I went to uh, Meadow Park Nursing Home. Okay. And uh, left there to get help with um, addiction issue, okay. hoping that it would get help with that as well. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back, I started working again in January. I left I left Meadow Park in uh, September of 2014, and I started working for a um, nursing agency called uh, Lifeguard in 2015. And I worked with them for over a year, and then in July 2016, I started working for St. Elizabeth Healthcare. Okay. As well, I was still working for um, Lifeguard. You go into uh, like retirement homes. Um, we did a lot of different things, a lot of one-on-ones with people, mm -hmm. like in their own homes. Mm -hmm. Twelve-hour shifts, eight-hour shifts, okay. sitting with them. Okay. A lot of stuff I did was sitting with palliative patients. Right. Okay. That would be tough. I, hey, it was okay. Yeah. Like, because I knew they were going to die. Yeah. And it was just an opportunity to give the family a rest. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, it's an important role. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't see it that way and wouldn't even notice the care that these people are giving from people like yourself, right? Um, yeah. To give the families a bit of a break and, and take, take, take that role as... Is important that a lot of people don't see, right? Because so. when, some, when someone's dying in the house, mm -hmm. families don't want everyone to be asleep at once, right? And that can that's be right. very hard if you're not able to do that. That's right. But if you have a nurse there that says, no, it's okay, I've got this, I know the medications I get, it's going to be all right, then... Everyone kind of rest easy. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, back at Metal Park, what, were you, what was your addiction? Uh, hide your Right. I don't know. Okay. And what, like, how much were you using? I was a binge user, so okay. I would use what I could get a hold of okay. by stealing it from the patient. Okay. All right. And how would that work? Like, would, it, would it just be in their, in their allotted medications, or would you have access to a card to, um, to feed your there dinner? Was some, <coughs> there are some of their allotted medications. Some of them had um, confusion, so they couldn't tell the difference between what pills you were giving them, so I could give them a lot to give instead of their hiding more. Okay. Um, there was, uh, a lot of them had as needed, so it would be in a big card, mm -hmm. and then they'd say, I would just punch out that, oh, Barney needed two of those today, and oh, Billy needed three of those today when they really didn't. Okay. And that's how I would get a hold of it. Okay. Every once in a while, there was also a, um, Drug, but dr big drug uh, holder, like a safe almost that we would put the drugs in. Okay. Once uh, like if somebody died, yep. and there were like 23 hydromorphs left, would slide the whole card into the drug holder. Well, if you picked it up and turned it upside down and shook it, you'd get drugs back out of it. Okay. Right. So. so you had your weight. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and was that ever? an issue with, with that, were we ever confronted, or, or I did, would... did that go totally undetected for the, the time you were there? As we will learn, not once was Wetlaufer confronted for any of the medications she stole for personal use, or the doses she used to overdose her victims. A simple inventory control check could have saved the lives of many. There was a time when um, Hydromorph was delivered to the home, and it didn't get put away right away by the person who should have. And so I took the hydromorph and put it in my bag and took it home. And it wasn't discovered for months. 
And uh, so I just played down. When the police told me about it, I played down. Yeah. And how was that? Yeah. Right. So as a binge, a binge user then, like how much would you would you be using on a, I mean obviously you wouldn't use it on a daily basis if you're you binge yeah. using, but like how long did the addiction last for? Oh, the addiction lasted from, I think it started in 2008. So to 2014, at which time I went away and got treatment at a treatment center. Okay, good. Um, so as far as your latest position at um, St. Elizabeth, yeah, that was your last position as a RN. Is that yes, correct? it was. Okay, yes. and you said you resigned from there. Yeah. Okay. What what brought you to that? That that that's where things get a little crazy. Okay. This is part that I haven't told the doctors. Um, because it seems so stupid now. When my ex and I broke up in 2007, I was already taking the medication for my for my borderline personality disorder, and I was so angry. And it was like a voice said inside me. I'll use you, don't worry about it. And the different times that I have caused people's deaths or caused them discomfort through the um through the insulin. I believe it was the influence of that voice or whatever it was. It wasn't a voice in my head, it was a voice in here. And when I would do it afterwards I would hear like a laughter in my chest. So here, we have Wetlaufer's first description of her inside voice, which she claims to be using her to commit these acts. She frames the claim with, it sounds so stupid now, because she knows what she's about to say is an extraordinary claim. Note that the officer doesn't confront her on how crazy this sounds, and just lets her tell her story. This is to ensure that he obtains a complete admission from Wetlaufer, and not to upset her and to end the confession working for St. Elizabeth and I was doing well but it was a lot of pressure and the way that you know that I've helped people to die has been through insulin and uh, after my first my 30 day evaluation my uh, my uh, supervisor came to me and said you know I'm really sorry we want you for Woodstock, but we have so many kids through schools in Ingrid Falls that need help with their insulin pumps that you're going to start working in Ingrid Falls. Okay. And I panicked. I panicked. I didn't want to do that. Because I felt, you know, what if? So it's a kid. So about, I think it was about a week after that that I quit. Yeah. And then I, uh, I packed my stuff in the car and I drove two days into I drove into Quebec thinking like I would just sort of run away sort of thing. And then I thought, no, that's just stupid. So I came back and uh, I was going to tell my parents what was going on, but they had visitors from Scotland. So I didn't tell them. I just, <laughs> sorry, spent two weeks pretending to go to work. Okay. Most of the visitors in Scotland were here. Right. It's funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> and then um, once they left, I, did, I decided I didn't want to nurse anymore. I didn't want to hurt anybody anymore. So I also quit my other job. And then I decided, um, well, whatever Friday that was, that like I did a lot of looking into how I could get help that I realized I needed help with whatever this was. Because right. part of me had started to believe that it was the devil. Mm -hmm. And part of me thought it might be God as a purpose through my life. And uh, I know the doctor asked me those questions, but I didn't answer them because I was so ashamed. But I just, uh, I didn't want this to keep going on. So I quit both jobs. Looked into where I could get help. Dr. Fernando is my uh, psychiatrist, and he's not a very nice man. So 
I went on an online uh, support group and was talking to people on there, and they were saying, you know, get some help. So then I started researching some uh, site boards and stuff, and I saw CAMH, and they are the only um, mental health facility in Ontario that has an emergency department. Okay. So I made a decision, and I went, I went there one Friday morning. I took the train, and off I went. And before I went, I told um, two. I told three people what was going on. My uh, friend from AA, okay. and um, my uh, friend. Uh, I told them what was going on. They said yes, go and get help. And my friend drove me to the train station. And and when you say you told them what was going on. I told them that I had been killing people to the and so I it up. And they all said, yes, you better go get help. So off I went. Okay. Okay. And she drove you to the train station on, uh, on, the, on train. the Friday morning? Yeah. To the Woodstock train station? Yep. Yeah. So did you disclose the same thing to all those three people? That I had been giving insulin overdoses. I didn't say why, because at that point I felt so stupid. It, I, it just felt so stupid. And, and Beth, to be honest with you, I, I admire your the way that you're conducting yourself and, and telling us and having this conversation with me. I thank you for that. Um, and I'm not here to judge in any way. I know. So I don't want you to know that. And, know. and I'm not a doctor. I know you spent a lot of time at, at CAMH the last three weeks, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm far from a doctor, but I do appreciate you, you telling me uh, the truth and, and telling me uh, the way that these things happen and played out, yeah, and uh, and I admire you for that. And it's you know it's been a while because I've been stewing about like, do I give the names of the people right. that I killed? Right. Because then here's eight families that thought that their family member died peacefully mm -hmm. and normally, mm -hmm. and they didn't. And what's that going to do to those families? Right. And even up to uh, going to the going to the hospital, I decided I was just going to give the first names, and uh, my cousin said, listen, they know what years you work there. If you don't tell them the exact names, they're going to go in there and go over every single file, and that's going to be even worse for the families there. So that she was the one to give me that advice, to give the names. And as far as you know, have these people reached out to any of police agencies where they may reside to, to notify that you told them this? Or no. did you tell them in, in kind of confidence? And, and I told them in they confidence and they home. said they promised me they wouldn't tell anyone. Okay. But basically the, the implying was if I didn't get help, right. then they'd be on the phone the next day. Okay. I got you. So did you tell them basically then on I told them the like, Thursday? I told them the night before I went. Okay. So yeah. Thursday night? Yeah. And then you took off Friday morning? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's Basically, what they said was, you know, if you haven't gotten help Friday, then we're calling the police. We love you, but we're calling the police. Well, they just probably felt that they had an obligation, right? Yes, yeah. Yep. Maybe a moral obligation or whatever they saw, right? Yeah. Exactly. And do you feel that you're of a clear sound mind right now? Yes, I do. Conversing with me in this, in this room? Yeah. Okay. And, and everything that you're telling me is, is the truth and the best that you can remember? Yes. Yeah. Um, I could, I can appreciate where you're coming from as far as the work that you you went through. Um, obviously, I've never been a nurse, and I've never worked in, in the profession that you that you did. But I could imagine how overwhelming it is. Yeah. Um, having a lot of responsibility, uh, maybe not having the support of, of the administration or your, or your supervisors. You know, just kind of go out and get it done, right? Yeah. And uh, and that could be, I could see how that would be stressful, and I could see how that would drive you maybe into your addiction and, and other things. But um, I want to just go over this document, if that's okay, okay with you. Yeah. Okay, would you be willing to do that with me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here, you see the officer give Wetlaufer the benefit of the doubt and explain that he understands that the stressful job with no direct help may have been the factor that pushed her to do what she did, essentially lessening what she did for mass serial murder to just mistakes that occurred to an overworked, overstressed, underhealth nurse. 
The officer wants Wet Ralfer to be completely truthful when reviewing the list of people she killed. This tactic of acting as the crime was only a mistake will ensure Wet Ralfer isn't on the defensive in the coming admission. You, 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 you do your thing. Sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. Absolutely not. This is pretty... Excuse me, Major. I've only ever had parking tickets. I've never been arrested for anything. Well, like I said, you're not under arrest right oh, now, I know. but it is, uh, it is a very significant investigation, you're right. I understand. And like I said before, Beth, I, I do appreciate you uh, speaking with us. And I can imagine that, uh, does it feel like a weight off your shoulders? Yes. So yes you've been yes. carrying a burden for quite some time. And I've tried to get help a couple of times. Yeah. Well, sometimes it takes a few attempts to to finally commit to it, right? Yeah, I had a pastor that I told him he prayed over me and told me I'd be fine. And that was God's grace. And then When was that? That was uh, Halloween 2013. Okay. Yeah. And you, you kind of divulged to what had happened to your you to that point you're like with yes. involving these people. Yeah. All right. So so be, before we get into this, um, I know that there's a statement which we have and that I've watched where you attended the police station in Toronto, that yes. 52 division, is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. And I honestly I think it was Detective Hamilton and I honestly can't remember the other detective's name is now. I know it started with an A. Um, and you met with them for uh, an hour and a half. I was gonna say about an hour and a half. That was not <laughs> You had in your possession um, a photocopy of this document, yes, right? Okay. And you went through and you read it out. Yes. Okay. And then following that, they started uh, with the first name on the list, and they wanted to just try and get a little bit more detail of yes of, of the involvement in each circumstance, okay. each death, right? Okay. That's what I'd like to do today, and just get some more detail. Okay. Okay. So. It's a long list. It is. It is, but I think that to you and I, I think we can get through it together. Yeah, I'm and, sure we can. As long as you're patient with me. I, I've got all the time to look. So, um, how about we just do this together? I'll just bring this over okay. here. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So, I, I'm not going to have you read through this entire document because mm -hmm. I've already, ha you already did that, right? I have written it. I have read it. I have, you know, lived it. So. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Mr. Silcox. Yes. Okay, September of 2007. Yeah. Okay. He's the first one that died as a result of what I did. Okay. And, and before you get into that, you have signed some kind of page numbers, all that kind of stuff on each of these documents. So we'll just go in order of, of how you've written it, okay? And I know that the detectives in uh, in Toronto kind of had this in their possession and just kind of got you to recall some things. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just going to keep it here because, I mean, you've already written this out. So what's on here is we already know that. Um, I just have some follow-up questions okay. with, just with regards to each circumstance. So Mr. Silcox, um, it says here you were working at a double shift uh, from 3 to 7, right? 3 p.m. to 7 a.m. Right. Okay. And this was at Crescent Care? Yes. Okay. In Woodstock? Yes. Okay. And tell me about your, your knowledge of, of James and, and your daily interactions during a shift with him. Um, I didn't see him every time. He wasn't always my patient. I just knew from what uh, people had said that he would grab the, the nurse's uh, breasts and buttocks and he would say horribly inappropriate things about his wife that now he was there, you know, um, he was going to fuck all of us, she was going to fuck all of us, dog, and just would say inappropriate things. And he did touch me inappropriately once. And where was that? On, on your breasts. Body? On your breasts, okay. And were you alone in the room at that point? Yes. Yeah. Did he have a roommate at all? Did you have a roommate? I, he must have. He wasn't in a single room. So he was either in a double room or a quadruple room. Okay. Would you remember any other residents that would be roomed with him at that time? Or? No. No. Okay. no. That's okay. Um, what portion of the home would, would, was James in at this point? He was in the okay, there's an east wing, south wing, north wing. He was in the north wing, mm -hmm. so halfway down, and he was either in a double bed or a quadruple bed. And um, the the diagnosis of of his health at the, at the time you were caring for him, you remember? He was post hip surgery and he had dementia. Do you remember how old he was approximately? No, I don't. I didn't see him in his eighties. In his eighties. Yeah. Okay. And sorry, he was 
not a diabetic. Not a diabetic. And sir, you said he had dementia. Yes. Okay, which you've also noted here as well, right? Yes. Okay. So tell me about the night. Uh, was this the first person that you did this to? That I that I tried. Well, there were other people that I'd done it to who didn't die. Prior to James. Prior to James. Okay, and he's are they documented on here? He's the first one who died. Right. Back okay. here. But there's some other people who didn't die. Right, so I can't read that first name. I've read so Zelda Zelda. Adriana? Okay, so that was, I mean, they're both September oh, 2007, but that was yeah. before James? Yeah. Okay. So was this your first attempt at, at overdosing these people on insulin? Yes, Clotilda was. It was and I didn't really want her to die. I just, I don't know, I was just angry and um, had this sense inside me that she might be a person that God wanted back with them. Okay. And is that that feeling you're referring to that you had in your stomach sometimes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is that is that the point? And I hate to get off to a topic here, but the point where you had these feelings in your stomach and almost that laughter after it happened. Yeah. Is that the part that you didn't tell Dr. Khan? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to be clear on that. I told him about the laughter in my stomach, but not the feeling that this might be the person that God wants. Okay. Okay. So the, I just sounded so stupid. It's your feelings, right? Mm-hmm. I honestly felt that God wanted to use me. And he kept, Dr. Khan kept asking me, do you think God chose me for a special purpose? I kept saying no, because that did not sound like a special purpose, you know? Yeah. So, but yeah, I just had a sense after my marriage broke up that God was going to use me for something. And then after a while, I started to really wonder after some of the murders, if it was God or if it was the devil fooling me. Did you feel like you were doing the right thing for these people? No. No. I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do, but it wasn't what was right for them. Um, so, James, then, um, it was an evening that this one took place, right? Yeah. Um, it says here at about 9.30. Yeah. Run me through... About 9.30, I gave him a dose of uh, 50 milligrams of insulin. He's not, not diabetic. So I went into a, I used a borrowed insulin pen, borrowed insulin, and gave him an insulin shot. And at 3.30, the PSO, well, throughout the night he was yelling out, I love you and I'm sorry. And not, to, not to me, but just you could hear him calling out in his room, and that's what he was calling out. And then at 3.30, the uh, PSWs came to me and said that he was gone. So I did what we're supposed to do. I went and listened to his heart and chest, called the doctor, called the family because that's what they wanted. Family came in to sit with him for a while. Doctor came in and uh, said that his cause of death was from um, an embolism due to his uh, post hip. He'd had a he'd had hip surgery. Doctor ruled an embolism due to post hip surgery. Um, who do you think he was talking to when he was yelling out, I love you? I thought it might be his, his family. Okay. I really did. And when they came in and talked to me, they wanted to know if he'd said anything. Right. So I told them that I was so ashamed. Yeah. So ashamed. Yeah. When you were speaking with the family? Yeah. Okay. And is that the uh, the family that kind of commended you for the work that you had done? And yes, and that I've been there for him. And yes. How would that make you feel? Awful. Absolutely awful. How did you deal with it? Um, I just went home and went to bed. You know, I felt awful. Maybe I fought with my girlfriend. Did some exercising, you know. Yeah. Did some games on the computer and just tried to forget about it. Did you have a, uh, have a problem sleeping that night at all or anything like um, that, or did you? Well, I was working nights, so I was... Um, you during the day then? Um, I would say I tossed and turned a bit, yeah. I felt pretty bad. And I didn't want to see the family again. So I tried to make sure I wasn't working when they came to pick up the stuff and I wasn't. And what room? Do you remember the, like a room number or just like you no, said? No, it was down in our phone. The wing, yeah. Okay. When you in, where did you get the insulin from for James, for Mr. Stilcox? You said you had taken some insulin. Um, where was, did you get those? The insulin was kept in a fridge in the medication room. We had two medication rooms. And so it was kept in the fridge in the medication room. And uh, 
extra pens are kept in the drawer. So you could just say somebody you had someone admitted and you needed a pen in a hurry. So you just put the insulin in the pen and, and put the needle on and dial up the dose and give it. And how was that documented to know that, so the crescent care would know that you were taking that insulin? They didn't keep track of insulin. Okay. So it was just a, something that was available for the nurses use when they knew that it was appropriate for the certain patients? Yes. Now each patient has their own insulin. Right. And maybe somebody noticed, somebody may have noticed that a lot of insulin was missing if a lot was used, but I was always careful to use different people. Okay. Different people's insulin? Insulin, yes. Okay. And Mr. Silcox, then where, where did you inject the insulin into his body? I'm not really sure. I'm going to say his arm or his uh, torso. And did he know what was going on at that point? Not really. Was he uh, was he a verbal patient? Like, could he could converse oh, yeah. with you he, and he communicate? He didn't really converse. He did a lot of yelling out. I don't really remember him reacting when I gave it to him. So he didn't react? I, I don't remember him reacting, no. Would he maybe just think it's a, a regular portion of his day and Probably. receiving the medications that he, he so required? Probably to the Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else you can remember about Mr. Silcox? Um, his wife and daughter loved him a lot. Mm -hmm. And how does that make you feel? Crappy. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah, like I said, he could be a bit of a handful, but, you know, he ate and drank normally, he took his pills when he told him to, so nothing else I can really remember about him. But this is, you know, nine years ago. So. It's a while ago. Yeah. So, as far as Mr. Silcox goes then, besides what you were feeling in your stomach, and besides that you thought that this was a purpose that you were given on from your relationship for after breaking up with your husband, right? Yeah. You, you, you indicated that he wasn't a very nice man. No, he wasn't. Did, is that a portion of um, what happened? I don't know. Okay. I wonder if that's a portion of how I chose him. Mm -hmm. And afterwards I did feel a release and a release. Mm -hmm. Like a release of pressure. Okay. Because throughout this document and, and as we go through it, a lot of these people you kind of describe them as, as not very nice people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm not sure if that's a tendency or a, a pattern that we see as far as, is that why you chose these people? Yeah, I'm not, it might be, but I also know I just felt like they were the ones. Right. I had a feeling inside that they were the ones. Before, before you injected insulin in Mr. Silcox, was it a spur of the moment thing? Had you thought about it that uh, when you reported for duty at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Um, I started thinking about it about 6 at night, I think. Okay. And do you remember who the pronouncing doctor would have been? No. Like how, did that, how did that process work? That process, the way it worked was a uh, person found with no vital signs. Nurse goes in with a stethoscope, mm -hmm. listens for one minute. If there's no heartbeat, no uh, lung sounds, nurse goes and calls the doctor on call. Okay. Um, there was also a sheet that we had to fill out if we thought it was a coroner's case. In this case, I don't believe we thought it was. And then um, family is called. And the doctor may wait to come in and uh, pronounce in the morning. Okay. Family can come in and visit the body at any time. Okay. So then the PSWs would get the the body ready. Okay. So prior to the doctor announcing in the morning, the family could come in and yeah. spend time? Yeah. So the PSWs would just clean them up, put on, uh, you know, clean, clean bridges and right. clean up the bed and stuff. Right. So you said, you said, Mr. Silcox, you said we didn't think it was a coroner's case. Who, who, who's this? Oh, what did that mean? I guess I'm using the royal we. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. So would that be just a decision that you were trusting um, to make? No, there's a there's a form okay. on the computer, and you go down through it, and if it says if you take off anything that says yes, you notify the coroner. Okay, all right, but you would have clicked off those boxes yourself. Yes. Okay, so obviously, knowing that you had done this to Mr. Silcox, did you 
feel that you wouldn't click yes so that attention wouldn't be drawn to you? You know, I honestly can't remember if he was a corner case or not. Okay. He might have been. Now, with insulin... I would... I, even though I did this to these people, when I did their... But see, it's, it's phrased as, does anyone have a reason to believe that this death was not natural? Right. So, yeah, I would click... I wouldn't click that one. If I right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. And I just wanted to clarify that. Yes. Yeah. As we just heard, the officer caught Wet Laufer in a small lie about who checks and decides if the death of a patient should be escalated to the coroner's office for examination. After getting her to admit that she personally lied on the form to avoid this extra check, he quickly deflects away from that to ensure that Wet Laufer doesn't become combative or defensive. This was a great strategy, as he not only got valuable evidence for the case, but he also acts as if she shouldn't be concerned that she just admitted to falsifying this document. Okay. Um, anything else you can think about from Mr. Silfox? No. Okay. Maurice, how did you pronounce Maurice's last name? Grenat. Is it Grenat? Okay. So tell me a little bit about Maurice. It says that this occurred in September or, or October of 2018. Yeah. Uh, sorry, 2007. And this was at Crescent Care? Yep. Okay, tell me a little bit about your interaction with Maurice. He was another one who liked to grab breasts and asses. Okay. He was sometimes a, a patient of mine. See, at that time, I wasn't, I didn't have a set floor that I worked on. I worked on all the different floors of the nurse, kind of filling in. Okay. So, uh, he was, one afternoon I was working with him and he did grab me. And uh, again, I got that feeling inside that this is his time to go. So I gave him an overdose of insulin after supper. Okay. And uh, I believe he died the next day. And what was your shift that? Do you remember what shift it you were working at? It was 3 to 11. 3 p.m.? Yeah, to 11 p.m. To 11 p.m. So, like so he, died, he died when I wasn't there. Okay. And he was known for... It says you're grabbing this ass, breast, and asses. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And do you remember who you would have been working with at that point? No. Okay. Do you remember um, where Maurice was within Crescent Care? Yeah, he was down in the north wing. I think he was in a, in a double room on the right-hand side. Okay. Yeah. And do you remember who and his roommates would have been at all? No, I don't. But I do remember that when he started going downhill after the insulin overdose, they moved him to the palliative care room right by the uh, nurse's desk. Okay. And at what point of the day do you think that you, sorry, I think you said this already, but just to confirm, what, what time of the day do you think it was when you had injected him? When I injected him? Um, it was afternoon, beginning at 4.30, 5.30. Okay. All right. Um, and what was his reaction to receiving the insulin? Again, it was just kind of like, oh, okay. I just said, the doctor wants you to have vitamin shot. That's what I usually say. And was he able to communicate? Was he verbal? He was, he was verbal. Could converse? Not totally, but he could say something, yeah. Okay. Right. And did he question his vitamin shot at all? No. Um, and he passed away the next day? Yeah. Okay. So, being that you weren't there when you had passed away, you wouldn't have been the one checking the boxes. That's right. So, do you know, by chance, what nurse would have been responsible for uh, Mr. Uh, Burnett? No, I don't. No? No. Okay. Did you ever have any concerns that he didn't pass away while you were working and that, you know, physician may arrive? No, I no, I didn't. I, well, yes, I did a little bit. I always wondered if they'd find the site where I gave the shot and something, you know, they there'd be an investigation. I always wondered that. Right. But other than that, no. And even though it, it passed through your mind, did you just and continued just, on about your duties? Yep. Okay. And do you remember what part of the body he would have been injected in? Oh, maybe the leg. Because at that point he didn't have a lot of body fat, so... Maurice didn't know? He didn't know. And when you get a, a subcutaneous injection, it goes in to the body fat, so... Okay. 
And you documented that he was a cancer patient? Yes. Okay. Do you remember what type of cancer he had? I think it was prostate. Prostate? Prostate, yes. Yeah. Okay. And what was the what did the outcome uh, hold for his future as far as the, the cancer in his body? He was dying. Awesome. How old do you think Reese was? 75, 76. Okay. Right. I'm sorry, he was in a double room? Yeah, I believe it was a double room, yeah. Do you remember who you had been working with that day? No. Same supervisor, or the head nurse? No. Sorry, I'm... That's I, okay. It's so far... It's a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's a significant event in your life, but it's a yeah. long time ago. Yeah. So, I, I, no, I'm not, I don't, I'm not concerned that you can't remember every question that I ask you. That's, you just, if you can do the best that you can, that's all I can ask for. Okay. Okay? Um... Anything else you can remember about uh, Maurice at all? Not really, no. No. Okay. Do you there know were, if, you know if he was a coroner's case? Him. There were people who loved him, that's what I remember. I don't know if he was a coroner's case. Who loved Maurice? Who did you know that would he come had, visit him? He had friends that would come and visit him, that were like family. Mm -hmm. um, the next person on your list is Helen Matheson. Yeah. Okay. So you go from. September or October of 07. Yeah. And then Helen was 2011. Yeah. What what happened between those years? I think um, you'll see that they... Was there some attempts? Attempts. Okay. Um, In 08 and 09? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we'll get to those. Yeah. Okay. Helen, I don't remember a lot about. She was very quiet, very determined. Um, just seemed to be waiting to die. Mm -hmm. Again, I had that feeling that, you know, this is the one. Mm -hmm. And um, I made a bit of a fuss about her that night because she was very lucid. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how much she liked blueberry pie and ice cream. Okay. So on my on my break, I went to uh, Walmart. I got a small blueberry pie and some ice cream mm -hmm. and brought it to her. And she ate three or four bites. Yes. And then that night, I overdosed her. Like I said, I had that feeling that it was her time to go and... What do you mean by that? Do you think she was towards the end of her life at that point? No, that she was the person to go to. As we have heard and will continue to hear, Wetlaufer always frames her victims as either patients who would verbally or sexually assault the other nurses, or patients who whom she could feel were going to die. In some cases, you will hear Wetlaufer claims the patients would express to her that they wanted to die. None of these claims were able to be verified by the police, and are most likely Wetlaufer's way of reasoning with herself why she would ever want to kill someone so weak and helpless to begin with. In your mind, in your stomach, in my, where was that feeling? In my chest in area. Chest. After I did it, I got that laughter. Okay. When would you feel that laughter? Would you feel it right after you injected it, or once the person passed away? Um, both. Yeah. Both. And Helen was, uh, you did hear that she wasn't a diabetic? No. Okay. Just out of curiosity, how much insulin would it take to kill someone See, that know. wasn't a diabetic? Or I don't know. You don't know that? No. So it's kind of hitting that. You didn't know that as a nurse, that this amount? Or no, there is no set amount. Okay. And I'm just, I, I just yeah. simply just don't know that no, answer. There is no part. set amount. Okay. All right, so different people would react differently to different amounts, is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah. And, and would it obviously make a difference if they were diabetic or not a diabetic? Yeah. I believe she died the next day. And it said, uh, I don't know, the doctor declared her to be a palliative, and she died two days later. Two days later, okay. And do you remember how much insulin that you had given out? 60? I don't know. And where would you have gotten that from? From, from the same supplies same. I always get it. Do you remember where Helen was in, in Crescent Care? Yes, she was on the south wing, and probably about four doors down from the nurse's station, in a double room on the right-hand side. If you were facing the end, she was on the right-hand side. Um, you don't say a lot of negative things about Helen here. Did you, did you get along with her okay? Did she ever do anything to, to harm you or...? No, no, she was very quiet. It was just 
I got that feeling that this thing is just next to the time so. And uh, her health at that point, what was her diagnosis? She was, um, I couldn't tell you her diagnosis, just that she was, she didn't get out of bed a lot, and she had to be fed her food and fed her pills. So she was, she was near her end of the life. How old do you think Helen was when this happened? Just say about 85 or 86. And do you remember what doctor would have? Were you there when she passed away the two days later? I don't think so. You don't think so? So you won't, wouldn't be which, which doctor pronounced her even no. too sure? Once I gave the insulin overdose, unless I was there for the shift to die, I just kind of laid low and didn't, you know, have anything to do with them. So, so if you issued an insulin injection to somebody, Helen, for instance, do you remember where Helen was injected? Probably her arm. Okay. Um, so, do you remember if she had a reaction at all? A reaction? Mm -hmm. Did you know if she confronted you and what you were doing at all? Was she able to... She might have said, ow. Was she used to getting insulin or needles? I don't know if she was. Okay. All right. Um, but she wasn't combative or, or mm -hmm. she didn't confront you and ask you what you were doing? No. And you said once once you gave them their insulin? Did you just, I just kind of, I tried to stay away from it. Sometimes I was very interested to see what was happening. Mm -hmm. I would just try to stay away from it. Okay. Would you ever go back into their rooms if while they were still alive to see kind of how they were progressing through the... If they were, if they were my, if they were my uh, charge, yes, I had to. Okay. Even though you had attempted to save their lives? Yeah. Okay. And you would, um... What kind of symptoms would they show? Is it different for everyone? Or? Um, well, usually they get very diaphoretic, red. Um, they could lose consciousness. They'd shake. Some people, um, one person had a seizure. I think it was just one person. Mm -hmm. Two people stroked right out. Right after receiving the... Not injection. right after, but they stroked out. Over time. And actually, three people because they believe James stroked it as well. So. Mr. Silkhoff. Mr. Silkhoff. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, November 2011. Mm hmm. Mary Zerwinski, is that yeah. how you recall uh, her last name being pronounced? Yeah. And this was at Crescent Care? Yeah. Okay. And you said that she wasn't a diabetic, but she had dementia? That's right. But she could talk and communicate a lot. Mary could. Yeah, she was she was uh, feisty. Was she? Yeah. She didn't hurt the nurses or anything. She was just very outspoken and feisty. And one night she said, "You know, I'm gonna die tonight." Mary said that. Yeah. And I said, "Oh." And she said, "Yeah. Why don't you get me into the Why don't you get me into the deathbed so I can die?" And I said, "Are you sure?" And she said, "Yeah. Put me to bed. I'm gonna die." So I said, okay, and I went to the other nurse that was working with me, and uh, she said, oh, okay, well, let's put her inside the care room if that's what you want. So we did, and then I thought, well, she must be the next one. Mm -hmm. I had a feeling inside of me she must be the next one. Because she was saying she was going to die, but there was no sign she was going to die. So I gave her an overdose of insulin. And she became palliative and she died. I think it's been a couple of days. I think. Yeah, so she's died in the next half minutes, but you can even go here. But, um, oh, here it is. Oh, perfect. Some water. Sure. There you go. Which one has the vodka in it? <laughs> no answer from him. Um, so. And do you remember how much insulin you would have given Mary? I think she may have been the first person that I gave long acting and short acting to together. Okay. I think. And can you just, well, besides the actual obvious, uh, in the uh, title of the, the actual drug itself, long acting and short acting, what was the biggest difference between the two? One 
one drops your blood sugar right away, the other um, starts working through your body and dropping it gradually over long periods of time, and it just keeps dropping it. Okay. And what would the combination of those two do together? Uh, Did you know much, or? I didn't know for sure, but I figured it would be much stronger than just the short acting. Right. Okay. Which makes sense. Yeah. Okay. You would know more than I would, but... Um, do you remember where you injected Mary? Uh, probably her arm. Yeah. I told her I told her it was for her pain. And you know she was in a single room, double room. Well, we had moved her from the double room to the uh, palliative care room, right okay. in her corner from the nurse's office. So where did you inject her in the palliative bed or in her? In the palliative bed. Okay. And she she had vocalized to you that she thought that she was going to die that night. Yeah. So I thought, okay, she must be the one. When I gave the insulin, I got that feeling inside and the laughter. Has she ever said something to, like, something to you before about wanting to die? Mm, not like that. No, she was like, I want to die, I want to die, I want to die tonight. I'm being dead, I'm going to die. And that was new to you? Yes. Do you remember what shift you were working? Afternoon, 3 to 11. And about what time do you think you would have moved her into the palliative bed and, and um, Might have been after supper, so about seven. And Mary ever dying to harm you or no. upset you in any way? No. No, she was fun. Okay. She was, so she was funky and, and outspoken. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you remember being present when she died? I don't think I was. And therefore, probably wouldn't be a part of checking the boxes. No, no, I didn't do the boxes for her. Who was there to see Mary on a regular basis? Who came to see Mary? I don't know. No. I don't know. Do you know if she had family? Um, maybe a son, but I don't know. victim. Yes. Uh, the fourth person that, uh, well, that you were successful in, uh, in these insulin injections. How did your emotions start to, to feel as it um, kept continuing? I kept having a lot of guilt. A lot of guilt. Um, Mary, well, as you'll see, after Mary was Gladys, and after Gladys, there was a period of two years where I didn't do it. Three years where I didn't do it. What was going on in your life at that point? I was trying very, very hard to get close to God, to make sure that this wasn't Him, and to just live my life, read the Bible, go to church, and not do that, because I didn't want to do it anymore. As significant and disturbing as this may be to the people that are going to hear this and, and learn about this, obviously there's a lot of uh, families that we're going to contact yes. and, and speak to. Um, although this wasn't, and I hate to classify it into different areas, but these weren't necessarily violent deaths. Like, how did, Do you think these people died peacefully? Did they struggle at all? Um, all the people you've talked about so far died peacefully, in my opinion. And I am sorry. I'm sorry for what the families went through at the time, and I'm extremely sorry for what they're going to go through. I, it's awful. If you could say something to them, what would you say to them? What can you say to them? That would matter. Um, I'm sorry isn't enough. I should have gotten help sooner. Um, I took something from you that was precious and it was taken too soon. Um, I honestly believed at the time that God wanted me to do it, but I know now that's not true. And uh, if I could take it back, if I could get help sooner, I would have. And that's sorry. Like I said, I admire you for everything. Whether it took one year, two years, ten years, whatever it took for you to finally get help, that's, that's a big step. Oh, thank you. Right? I mean, you could have been in this situation.
situation and, and taking this to your grave. Yes. And who would have known? Right? That's what I was told to do by a lawyer. What's that? Take it to my grave and not tell anybody. So you've confided in a lawyer as well about this? A long time ago, yeah. Was it after all of these people? It, it was in 2014 before I... Uh, like before you went to Welland? Or, yeah, sorry, to the, the Welland Rehab Center? Yeah, to the Rehab Center. So you spoke to a lawyer? I spoke to a lawyer. And that, she was the one who told me to get out. Um, I need to go to the bathroom. No problem. No. Just for the record, and uh, so it's documented, I have 6 26. Let's we'll yeah. take a break, okay? Yes, yeah, thank you. Cool. All set? Yeah. Do you need anything else at all? No. Are you sure? No, I had a caramel. Oh, did you? So, Gladys, so let's take this to November of 2011 mm -hmm. at Crescent Care. Um, it says here Gladys was a type 2 diabetic um, and had dementia. Severe dementia. Did she? Yeah. How old do you think Gladys was? Nine, 92. 92. Okay. And where was Gladys within uh, Crescent Care? East Wing, um, three doors down from the main desk, in a double room. Tell me a little bit about Gladys. What did you see? What was she like when you um, cared for her? Well, when I first started caring for her, she was walking and talking, and she had quite the spirit. Um, she once, <laughs> she once punched a man. Oh. Because uh, she, she overheard the nurses telling one of the gentlemen, no, you can't push your wife around, you have to come with us. And she turned around and she said, you can't treat a woman like that. Boom! And hit the man. And hit the man. <laughs> so then we're all in a state of trying to keep them from fighting with each other and trying to keep them from hurting us. So right. Yeah, she was oh, very smunky. But she went down, downhill fast. Did she? Eventually, um, she was, she had, um, Dementia, didn't take her pills well, didn't eat well, very stubborn woman. And uh, as always, one evening I just got that red surging feeling that she was going to be the one. Mm -hmm. And um, gave her insulin overdose. Did you ever get that feeling outside of work? No, never. No? Did you ever get that feeling going to work, knowing that something was going to happen that shift? No, it always happened at work. So, if I were to use the phrase spur of the moment, would it be something that you would just have that feeling come on? Or yeah, I guess you could say it was spur of the moment, but it would it usually start happening, you know, focused on one patient, and then this, I would feel that red surging, which is what made me think it was God. Which I am so embarrassed. Well, like I said, I'm not here to judge you. Right? I know. Right? I know. Um, and you explained that it was difficult for her towards the end giving her her pills. Um, do you remember where you were working with uh, the shift when you injected glass? I believe I was working, I was either working nights or days. Okay. Because I know it was close to the end of my shift. Okay. And I did it, and the person who came on next shift, I think it was night. So the person who came on next shift checked her all over and started to call the doctor and had her made palliative and started her on a pain, pain regimen and... And do you remember how much insulin you gave her? No, I don't. Do you remember if it was long or short or a mix? I, I probably, at that point, I think it was giving everybody a mix. Okay, so once once Mary was the first person you said yeah. that you gave the, the long and the short acting to, yeah. and then following that it was... Everybody. ...going from there yeah. forward. Um, and that was, a, again, at Crescent Care. Yeah. Was that insulin taken from the same location as, yeah. as you always would? Yes. Yeah. Is there cameras in, in, in the bedroom? No. No? No. Nothing at all? No. Okay. So you could access whatever you like and... Well, not whatever you like, but yeah. But the insulin, because the you said insulin. they didn't even keep track of it. Um, the insulin, uh, yeah. The insulin, um, you could get volume, you could get, like, injectable volume. Um, yeah, it was fairly easy to take meds from there. Um... We'll get into Sorry, I was going to ask you a question, but we didn't that bit down the road. Um, you know how long it took for Gladys to die? I believe she died the next afternoon, or that afternoon. Okay, and do you know if you were present for that? No, I was not. So therefore, it wouldn't have been a part of the, the process of, 
Was it pronouncing and checking the box? No. Um, when someone's dying, it seems like it takes longer than it does mm -hmm. if you're around, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that you don't know. Thank you. What would play through your mind on, on your days where you inject, so glass, for instance, you inject her, uh, you work nights, it says here, so yeah. 11 till 7, you did this at 5 o'clock, you go home and carry her on about, if you have one, two, three days off, whatever yeah. the case was, what was going through your mind on those I days off? Were you thinking, when yeah. was, when's glass going to die? I would wonder if she had died, I would wonder, you know, if this would be the time I would get caught, mm -hmm. you know, what was I going, every time... Every time I walked in after somebody passed away, I always wondered if this day I'm going to get caught. Mm -hmm. What kind of consequences play through your head? Okay? Like if you, if, damn, I'm, I'm caught in the gigs up. What, what kind of consequences do you think yeah. you're going to face if, if that were to happen back in 2011? Fired, jail, um, no more nursing license. That's exactly what I'm looking at now. Although I took myself out instead of being fired, but right. jail and no more alert nursing license. As far as in 2011, though, and, and having that feeling, like when did those feelings start to say uh, in your mind, like, I wonder if this is the time I'm going to get caught? Probably it happened right at Mr. Soapbox or did it? Yeah, yeah, probably every time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Gladys, do you think, uh, did she have a reaction when you injected her? She fought a little bit. Did she? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Like she struggled around, so I, I found a spot on her leg that I could do where she couldn't reach me and pinch me. Okay. Would that be something difficult if you were giving her medication she'd like yeah. to pinch? Pinch. Scratch. Feel up her mouth. Is that common medications? Yeah. 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 Okay. And um, like even the, the PSWs who had to change her uh, product, mm -hmm. sometimes she'd fight them and scratch them and pinch them and twist their hair and do you think that played into any part of your actions with Gladys? Um, Particularly with Gladys? I don't know. I think some of the, the um, I think some of it did, you know, the stubbornness and stuff. And, yeah, just kind of, okay, you're the next one to go. But again, there was always that red surging that I identified with God telling me, this is what, you know, this is how you work for me. Did you ever try and fight that feeling? Later on, as you'll see. Mm -hmm. okay. But when you got that feeling in your chest and, and stomach, would you would you directly go to get the insulin? Um, pretty much. Yeah. As soon as I had time with the rest of my job. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you remember how much you gave Gladys? Of the insulin? Mm -hmm. I think I gave her eighty sixty. Okay. I think. And her reaction after after she kind of pinched and, and struggled a little bit with you? She relaxed, and then um, by the time the next nurse came on, she was red, she was sweating, she was incoherent. She, her, blood saw it, her vital signs were all down. And how do you know that? Because I was just leaving when the next nurse came on, and she CSWs came to her and she said, something's going on with God, and she she said, come with me, we have to go check on Gladys. And so, yes, yeah, so I actually helped him with Gladys to the palliative care room. Okay. And scared out of my gourd the whole time <laughs> that she was going to say it was something I did. Thinking, okay. Was she still able to communicate at that point? No. Okay. Do you remember what nurse that was that you moved? Karen? Class? Mrs. Helen Young. So this is where you have a bit of a gap again. From yeah. 2011 to 2013 with your successful yeah. injections. But there was, and there wasn't even any attempt. No. Yet. No, if I'm, in November 2011, I came home from a uh, cruise of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and I was feeling guilty. I was feeling damned. I was feeling confused. I, I was feeling like I just didn't want to do it anymore. I was feeling like if I could somehow connect with God strongly enough that I wouldn't do it anymore. And so I spent a lot of time reading my Bible and praying and deciding I just wasn't going to do it anymore. So I had the odd urge to do it, but I resisted by going to church, reading my Bible, praying, 
And telling God I didn't believe him that he wanted me to do it anymore. Fighting off that, do, would you still have that feeling, like that burning feeling? Sometimes, but I, I did a lot of praying about it, and I would, I just did a lot of praying, reading my Bible, getting very involved in my, in my faith, getting very involved in my church. Right. Okay. I did, obviously, with what you've told us so far, that it helped. Yeah. What you've documented. Yeah. Is there anything else that we need to be aware of that happened in between those times? No. Okay. No. I didn't tell anybody or anything like that. Okay. So Helen was uh, at Crescent Care. Where was uh, where was Helen's room? She was on A side. I had been transferred to A side, which is a new unit, like well, relatively new, 10, 10, 12 years old. I was on the first floor. I was the charge nurse for the first floor, and she was in the room closest to the nurses' station. And Helen was a type 2 diabetic with dementia? Yeah. Okay. Tell me a little bit more about Helen. Uh, Helen was miserable. She frequently yelled out, help me nurse. She frequently yelled out she wanted to die. She just was not happy with her life. She would wheel, wheel around in her wheelchair saying, help me nurse, help me nurse, help me nurse, help me nurse. And when you went to help her, what do you want help with? Nothing. Get away with me. Go away. Help me nurse, help me nurse. Didn't want to eat, didn't want to drink. Very difficult to deal with. Um, constantly would yell at, and or we'd say, "What do you want help with? I want to die. Why can't you help me die? I want to die." And one night it was like something snapped inside, and that red surge came back, and I thought, "Okay, you will die." So uh, I gave her a shot. I came up to her and said, "This is for your pain," and I gave her a shot of long acting or short acting. And she started to settle down, and then um, later on we put in, her in the bed, and I gave her more off, more of the uh, insulin. I think it was long acting. She had a seizure. She turned red. She um, was diaphoretic. The PSWs called me to the bedside. Um, I took all of her vital signs, and I pretended to take a blood sugar. And said, oh, it's normal. Don't worry about it. How did you go about that with people beside you? Their PSWs. <laughs> don't, no, don't let anybody no see that part the of PSWs? the... PSWs? No, but what I mean is, what I mean by that is PSWs, nurses sub, nurses focus on the meds right. and treatment. Okay. PSWs focus on, like, they were busy. They were busy washing her. They were busy changing her. They were busy dealing with the fact that she was having diarrhea. They were not doing the part of the job I was doing, right. so they never would have noticed. Where's my burger? So they never would have noticed um, me not taking the blood sugar. Because I took her, like I did her pulse, I did everything else, so they wouldn't have noticed that I didn't do that because they were busy with everything else. Okay. Okay. And then you just said, oh, the blood sugar's good, 5.6, she's good. Was it a, a number that in your mind you knew was average and nothing concerning the 5.6 yeah. or whatever you said? Yeah. Okay. okay. So being that it had been a few years then, um, when you injected uh, Mrs. Young and you were successful in, in causing her death, how did it make you feel after those few years that these, these urges and these feelings had come back? I felt horrible. I felt angry at myself. I felt like I had failed myself. I felt like God had failed me. Did you continue to practice in the church? I continued going to church, yeah. Did you believe in it as much as Um, I did, but I was getting very confused. So it was soon after that that I went to the pastor and told him what had happened. And uh, he prayed over me. And because he said that was the last thing he would have thought of was me, and his wife was there too, and they prayed over me, and they said to me, now this is God's grace, but if, if you ever do this again, we will have to turn you into the police. And where would these come, where would that conversation have taken place? The in, no, in their house, at their kitchen table. And I kept going to their church. And did, how detailed would you have the conversation? Oh, I had 
I told I told him that I was taking people's lives by giving them in form of addresses. But were you specific with names? How much information no. when you were doing this? No. How many people? I don't know if I told him how many people did, but I was doing it. I wanted to stop. Okay. And his response was to pray for you and pray over you. Yes, put, put his hands on me and have his foot put his hands on me and pray. Did Helen have any family that you were called to Yes, her? she had a niece that loved her very much and was there at least twice a week. Did you ever converse with her? Before before she died, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How old was she? I'm saying the late 50s, early 60s. The niece? The niece, yes. Yeah. And Helen or something? 90. Right. Did you speak to her following Helen's death, her niece? What? I think it was a day or two after when she was gathering her stuff and she cried on my shoulder and thanked me for being a good nurse. And again, the feelings that you had at that point? Oh, guilt, shame, anger, like I had betrayed her. And not that I was betrayed, but betrayal, mm -hmm. but I betrayed her. And did you display any emotion at that point to her? Um, I just, you know, gave her a hug back and said I was so sorry. But at that point, it's when I was getting very confused about was this God and was it not. And when you resumed doing this, did you have any, besides the religious feelings that you were having, did you have any other uh, personal um, feelings in your mind as, as far as knowing the difference between right and wrong again? Yes, yes, I knew the difference between right and wrong. But I thought this was something that God or whoever wanted me to do it. So I'm starting at that point to, to doubt that it was God. Okay. When you resume doing it? Yeah. Okay. March of 2014, this is Marine Victor Ann Crescent Care. Yeah. Tell me about Marine. Mm. Marine was a handful. Um, She would attack other patients, she would pull their hair, she would hit them, she would pinch them. Eventually, um, it was decided that she needed a one-on-one -on -one staff. So sometimes they would book an extra PSW to be with her. Sometimes someone would come from the outside to be with her. But when one woman was, wasn't available, it was the role of the charge nurse. And that was nuts. Sorry. That's just absolutely nuts. So, um, she just got harder and harder to look after. And one night when I had had to look after her, I got this idea. I thought, you know, I started to get the feeling of that surge again. I thought, no, I don't want her to die. But if I could somehow give her enough of a dose to give her a coma or something to change her brain waves, maybe make her less. You know, maybe make it less mobile, hard to handle, less handle, hard to handle. Right. So, uh, yeah, if I was a doctor. And as well, obviously, a single room at that point. Yeah. That um, night, she stroked. She had a severe stroke. She went to the hospital. And when she came back, she was there for a few, there at the nursing home for a few days, and she died. But before she came back from the hospital, I was fired from Crescent Care for medication errors that had nothing to do with this. And so sorry, Maureen, uh, Mrs. Pickering was transferred from Crest Care to the hospital. And then and back, back to Crest Care. Yeah. How, what was the time frame there, do you remember? Two days, I think. And but they knew that she was totally vegetative when she came back. Okay. So she was basically was coming back to, to pass away yeah. at Crest Care. Yeah. Was she put in palliative care when she returned? No, because she had her own room. Do you remember how much insulin that you gave to Mrs. Pickering? It was a lot. It was a lot. Um, I'm going to say 80 long acting and 60 short acting, something like that. That was a lot of insulin. Why so much to her? Wasn't sure if she would die or not. And I really wanted to make sure that she, uh, their mind would change a bit before she came after. So the insulin caused her uh, a stroke, a stroke and, then, and then the reason to travel to the hospital. Yes. 
Um, do you remember any reaction from her when you were injecting her? No, none at all. Do you remember what type of level, sorry, I apologize, what part of the body that you injected her? Her. Left, right? Um, left. Left up. I had no reaction. She didn't. Um, oh yeah, the first time I gave it to her, she said, hey, what was that for? And I said, that's your, that's your vitamin injection. Which is a said that you would typically tell people? Yeah. Okay. How long in between when you gave her the next dose? Probably an hour and a half, two hours. And that was about what time did you say, sir? Oh, I don't know. You were still working in the afternoon, right? Yeah, eight or nine at night. Okay. Did uh, Miss Pickering, did you recall any family that she had? She had two friends that came and saw her a lot. She had a boyfriend that would come to see her. Okay. How old was she? 82. Do you, do you remember if you were present when she passed away? I was not. I'd already been fired. Or did she come back and then? She had come back and then I was fired. And then she but lived for a few more days. Yeah. You were fired in the meantime. Yeah. And she passed. For something that had nothing to do with her. And my timeline may be wrong. Mm -hmm. It may have been February. Mm -hmm. Because I know that... I know by the middle of April I was working again at um, Meadow Park and just home. Yeah, and Yeah. What was the, the cause of your your firing ones, right? There was a medication or something? I had had a few medication errors. And strangely enough, not on her wrist. One of our residents was missing her long-acting insulin that she got at supper, okay. and it was coming from a pharmacy, but I wanted to make sure she got her insulin, mm -hmm. so I took insulin from another person who I thought was the same insulin, but it was short-acting, mm -hmm. and it gave her a seizure because she wasn't used to it, and she was she was okay. We, we helped her, and she was all right. Did the cackling continue? When Mrs. Young was injected with insulin? Um, After that two year break? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it did. It same, same, same feeling, same cackling. Same feeling, same cackling. So then you. Did you work anywhere between Crescent Care and Meadow Park? No. Okay. Did you go directly from one to the other? Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. And, and would those medication errors be documented in a reference letter? or No. Were you made aware of anything like that? The Meadow Park uh, would be aware of? The reason why you were um, I told the person that hired me at Meadow Park, um, when we did our interview, she said to me, why did you leave? And I told her, I said, I'll be absolutely honest with you, I was fired from Medairs. And she said, well, tell me about them, and I did. And she said, okay, well, I believe in second chances, so you're hired. Full-time afternoons, and it was a one-year contract. So, RPAD, or r core app? Yes. Um, he was mean. He would grab the nurses and these and PSWs whenever they were trying to do things for him. He would grab them. He would twist their arms. He would punch them. Very difficult to do uh, care for. And uh, one night I just got that surgery. And I thought that you need to go. Had he done something that night? No, not really. Just been his normal self. And he fought. He fought the first needle. And then um, the second needle I got in, and I forgot something about Maureen. Mm -hmm. I had given her um, a dose of whatever we dosed her with to calm her down before I ever gave her the insulin. Forgot about that. So I had done that. So Is that in there? About Maureen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had given her a sedative dose before I ever gave her the insulin. Oh, you said you gave her Haldol? Yeah. And you recall doing that? Yes, I did. And then the two insulin injections? Yeah. And did it calm, did the Halidol calm her? Do you remember? No, no, it didn't. So, Art, I gave a large amount of short acting and a large amount of long acting in between each other. And then I, when I left for the night, he was still okay. When I came back the next day and worked, they said that he had had a stroke severe stroke and gone to the hospital. 
And the nurse that I talked to who'd been on the night before, she said, do you know how low his blood sugar was? And I said, how low? And she said, oh, like one point something. And then, and then she said, but you know what? I went home and I did some research. research mm-hmm. And sometimes having a bad stroke can make your blood sugar go low. Really? Yeah, that's what she said to me. That was so, odd, too. Yeah, that was odd. But, yeah, so he lived for a couple of days and then he passed. Um, and do you remember what time of the night that you had injected her? Um, I'm going to say 7.30 and then 9.30. Okay. And um, his reaction to it? He fought it. Did he? Yeah, but he fought everything. Would you ever, when you were doing this, were you ever, did you ever speak to these people when you were injecting them? No. Would you ever say anything to them? Not unless they asked me what I was doing, then I'd just say it was a vitamin injection. But having that... And I know it's documented here a few times having that feeling of anger and, and frustration. Would you ever... No. You would never state anything to vocalize your, your anger towards that person as you were injecting them? No. Never. And are then, um, where did you inject him? His arm and his thigh. Okay. And what were you telling him at that point that you were giving him? Did he ask? Um, it's just coming up, but then you need to have your medicine. And eventually I put it in there. And was there an immediate reaction to him at all? Did he, did he stroke right away? No, he didn't stroke till I left. Okay. And then that's when you came in the next day and had the conversation with that Filipino nurse? Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry, I don't remember her name. That's okay. Um, the four or five days later when he passed away, do you remember if that was back at Meadow Park or was it in the hospital? Yeah, it was in the hospital. Oh, so he never been, came back. It may have just been two or three days. It seemed like it was four or five. Mm-hmm. And his family was devastated. Absolutely devastated. What was his uh, health like at that point? Prior it, to other than him? Other than dementia, he was fairly strong. He was in a wheelchair, but he was a good eater and he was strong. And How old was he? I'm going to say maybe 78. Okay. And who was his family members following his death? Well, he was still in the hospital. They okay. came in, in to take some stuff, and then when he was gone, they came in to take the rest. Okay. How did you feel having a conversation with him? Awful. Um, again, like I betrayed them. We're getting there. I have seven fourteen. So we left that left off with Art, Mr. Yeah. Horvath, at uh, Meadow Park Nursing Home. Is there anything else you remember about Art at all? Not really. Well, he was a big game hunter. Was he? Yeah. And he had pictures of it all of his in this room. Yeah. Um. Now you have a portion of your on the, on the fourth page of this document that you wrote out. And before you present, when did you write this out? I know it's dated the 24th of September. Yes, that's when I wrote it. You wrote this full document at that point? 24th and 25th. Where were you at that point? I was at the nurse, uh, the uh, Cam H. And what made you prepare this document? The doctor suggested to me that I should. Okay. Not, yeah. not to give to the police, but he said he said that if I wrote it out, it would be a good part of my therapy. Okay. So and did take a large amount of pressure off me and helped me to really clarify the fact that no, it wasn't God, it was something wrong with me psychologically that was making me believe that it was God. Mm-hmm. It really helped me to clarify that. You have a portion on the fourth page here and it's titled, People Who Didn't Die. Mm-hmm. What can you tell me about? Okay, it's Clotilde Ayodurano. Okay. She was the first person I ever gave extra insulin to. Okay. I think I gave her 40, and it, I just, again, there was that surging, but it wasn't so much that I wanted her to die. It was more, let's see what happens. And I did I did that to her on more than one occasion. Okay. Uh, Albino I'm was... sorry, she was prior to Mr. Silcox, right? Yes. So this was the very first person that you yes. injected with insulin? Yes. Okay, and we're at Crescent Care? At Crescent Care. And? Um, then there was Wayne. He was on the... North Wing, he was he had dementia, he was diabetic. 
Um, he can be uncooperative. And uh, I gave him a large overdose um, because I thought it was his turn to go. That was Wayne? That was Wayne. And sorry, mm -hmm. how old was, sorry, and I hate to go back, I just have a few more questions. How old was Cathilda? Cathilda was yeah. 90 or so. Okay, and her sister? Albina was probably 80, 82. And then Wayne, how old was Wayne, sorry? I'd say 60. Okay, oh, so he was younger. He, yeah, he had developmentally developmental challenges, as well as dementia, as well as being diabetic, um, as well as being handful. Um, and uh, he wanted to die. So again, that one night I just felt that surging, and, but he didn't die. I think How would you know he wanted to die? He would say it sometimes, that he just wanted to go. Mm -hmm. right. And Mike with Huntington's disease? That was 2009. What, what does that mean? It robs you of your body and you still have your mind. You get progressively more agitated, you get progressively more um, psychotic, and you're in a wheelchair and you've got all these movements that you can't control. It's a horrible disease. And how old was Mike? He was 54. And uh, again, one night I just felt that surging and I thought, now this must be God because this man is not enjoying his life at all. So I gave him a large amount of insulin. I think I gave him 90 total. Did he ever do anything to harm you? No, never. Did Wayne? No. Albina? No. Cotilla? No. Um, this takes us to a different location, Telford Place in Paris. That's obviously Paris, Ontario, correct? Yeah. That's the of, uh, of Brantford, Woodstock area. 2016 winter. Okay, and that was Sandra? Yeah, How I old was, was Sandra? Sandra, I think she was in her 70s. And she described her a little bit of personality and her health? Um, tall, um, not very well. She didn't walk anymore. She had a good sense of humor. Um, she often said she didn't want to be there. And so one night I gave her a instant overdose. But she survived because the nurse that came on next um, went to check on her to do something else and noticed that she was sweaty mm -hmm. and took her blood sugar and saved her life. Mm -hmm. okay. And how did these other people survive? Um, it just didn't... Oh, Clotilda and Albina. Mm -hmm. They found them to have short blood. Sh they found them to have low blood sugar, and they gave them stuff to raise it. And Wayne and Mike, they just survived. It was never found out. Was there anything to do with the gender, male or female, that this influenced the effect of it, or was it just again not just dependent on the makeup yeah. of their body and their health? And yeah, not that I know if it has anything to do with gender. Um. The nurse who saved Sandra. Yeah. Was there anything that ever came back on you? No. Any retribution consequences? No. She never figured it out, but I know. She even asked me about it, not if I thought she'd done the right thing. Who was that? Do you remember her name? 2016 of August, which is not too long ago. Um, you're employed with St. Elizabeth, it says here. Yeah, I was frustrated with my job. I was had a huge, um, huge workload, having to learn a lot of new things, just a lot of frustration. Um, the weekend that this happened, there I had all, all of the people that I had to look after. Most of them were in Ingersoll. I didn't know any of them. And uh, on the Saturday, I went in and I was doing my care. And uh, this is really the only one that was pre. Because on Saturday when I was doing care on Beverly, I noticed that she had a pick line, which is the line that takes medication straight to your heart, mm -hmm. and that she was a diabetic. And so the next day when I went in, I was really frustrated, and I could just really feel the surging and the laughing, and I I gave her a huge amount. I gave her, I think it was 180, three, three doses of 60 okay. through the pick line. Did she question that at all? No, because I used one to rinse the pick line, one to put into her eyes, and one to rinse the pick line again. And uh, she survived. She was fine the next day.
Do you go see that again? No, but I was able to check it on my computer because she was seen every day by a nurse. Okay. So I could go into the tablet from work and see how she was. Okay. And that was just a computer program used by St. Elizabeth? Yes. I see. Okay. On their own tablet. Okay. And these other people, where did you inject them? Oh, uh, their arms. All of them? All of them, yeah. Sandy was probably her leg, but she was a little bit more difficult. How can you have a name, Beverly, but you're not sure what her name is? Because I'm not sure if it was Bev or B or... I gotcha. Okay. Okay. And that was the only one you had given through the pipeline? Yes. Did you know what the result would be compared to a direct injection into an arm or a leg or a thigh? I'd never done it line? before. I'd never looked at it. I had no idea. She went, she went to sleep fairly quickly, and I left, but when I checked uh, the next day to see how she was through the next nurse, there was no change. How old was she? She was 63, 64. And what was her diagnosis as far as her health? She was diabetic, and she had large ulcers on her legs. And she also had a um, severe infection. How does that make you feel going through all that? Awful. Do you feel like there's a burden left off your shoulders? Yes, I've so done the right thing. Do you feel there's a sense of relief? Yes, and now I know that it wasn't God, and I'm ashamed of myself that that happened, but I also think that it was mental health. You know, I think it was, I was in the, in the right mind. Or I would have been able to tell them. I mean, who, I was raised to believe in God. I was raised from a baby to go to, to Sunday school. So how could I get such a strong feeling that this is what God wanted, unless it was something wrong in my head? I know we've talked about what you would say to the families and, and so on and so forth, but um, again, I, I, I feel terrible for the for the people that are going to find out in the days and, and weeks to come about what actually happened to their loved ones, right? I do. Um, I feel horrible. Um, if there was ever anything I could do so that nobody did this again, I'd do it. Just a few other things to cover off then. Okay. Um, the things that some of these people would do to you, the hitting, the pinching, the grabbing of your breasts, would you ever report that? Yeah. But yeah, it was always reported in the charts on. And that's just documented on their charts? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And was there any, there's obviously never, not obviously, but was there ever any charges or criminal matters that came up any of this no, at all? No, no. That's part of working in the nursing home. That's just what they do. Might even be your fault, dear. Yeah, who said that? Mrs. Conway. Yeah. Do you think that might have played a role in, in your actions? No. Um, have you... This document that you prepared, Beth, and I know that you had stated the reason why I guess we call it the breaking point of why you stopped. Yeah. Was the possibility that you were going to have to be dealing with kids. Yes, that's right. Right? Yeah. Is there anyone else within your career path that isn't listed on these four documents, or these four pieces of paper, that you'd be responsible for their deaths? No, absolutely not. And if we were to tell you that we've come across some fairly significant or suspicious deaths at other nursing homes. Where it's in? Right. What would you say to that? I'd say it wasn't me. So there's no one else involved? No. Um, that was fell victim to your actions? No. Okay. What would we find in your home? Did you ever document any of this activity um, at all? Once in a while I, jol I journaled on it. There, it might, there might be some in my home, but I don't know. Where I think be? I threw it out. Did you live uh, alone? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes. Did you want someone to come with me or not? 
Well, to be honest with you, as part of the investigation, there's already been a search warrant executed at your house. Oh, so the search is already, it's already been a search I don't know what that? stage it's at because we've been conversing for quite some time. Okay. It's probably close to being completed. Okay. But I'm just asking because you've been so cooperative. Yeah. And, and again, I do appreciate that. Yeah. I really do. Um, it just makes things a lot easier, right? Um, advising us where certain things might be, and you said you might have thrown them out. Yeah. You might not have. I might not have kept them. What's your tattoo mean? Hopes and dreams. Does that mean that? That I have hopes for the future and dreams of the future. Yeah. What are your hopes for the future now, after speaking over the last few hours? That somehow, some way, I can help somebody. There's got to be somebody with wherever I go to jail, penitentiary. There's got to be somebody I can help. Maybe somebody who can't read. Maybe somebody who can't write. Maybe somebody who's done worse than me and feels like it will never be forgiven. Maybe somebody who's done less than me and feels like it will never be forgiven. There's got to be something that can come from this. Maybe somebody can study me and come up with answers and new medications so this doesn't happen again. That's my hopes and dreams now. Is there anything worse than taking someone else's life? Uh, yes. Child mom. Child molestation. Absolutely. Did you feel that you might harm the children and yourself if you were to work with them? I was afraid that it, that I might get that feeling of wanting to give them insulin or doses, especially since they were di diabetic. And I just I panicked. And there was no way. I was absolutely not open to that. Is there anyone else that you can think of right now? No. No. I think I did pretty good. I think you did. I'm just, gonna, now. I'm just going to get you to sit tight, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll arrange to, to uh, see what the next steps are. Oh, okay. I might not be going home then. I will get back to you with that. Okay. Um, sit tight for a few moments, okay. and I'll uh, be back to see you shortly, okay? Again, on my uh, phone, I've got 739. Okay. Yeah. And uh, let me get back with uh, some answers and okay. where we're going from here, okay? I'd like to go home. Okay. We'll sit tight and we'll, we'll see what's going on. You don't have to wear any bracelet. I'd like to go home. Okay. All right. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Beth. That's okay. You could imagine that uh, things of this nature take some time. Yeah, and I, I understand. And I appreciate your patience with me. I understand. Thank you. So, I have 802. I just have, we're in the home stretch here. Okay. Um, we're going to wrap things up, but here's what's, here's what's going to happen. Okay. Okay. And part of this is going to be up to you. Um, what are your plans going forward from here? Going you forward from here? Yeah. I want to go home. Okay. I want to have a good night's sleep. Okay. I want to spend uh, Thanksgiving weekend with my family. Okay. And I want to be available to the police at any time they need me. Okay. And if I have to come back for trial, I have to come back for trial. Okay. I have no plans of leaving. Um, I can turn to my car if you want me to. Okay. Are your parents... Are you close with your parents? Like, what kind very of relationship close. do you have with them? Very, very close. I have to tell them tonight what's happened. With mom and dad. Yes, they know that. Um, they know that I've been in. They know that I've been in the hospital, but they, I just told them it was for treatment. But okay. yeah, my plan tonight is to go and talk to them one on one, like face to face, and tell them. What do you think them. their reaction is going to be? They're going to be devastated. What do you? I'm think? gonna. I'm gonna plan on staying, staying the night there. So they have access to me. Okay. What type of support do you think you're going to get from there? Eventually, all the support I need. Okay. I also plan to go to my AA groups. I had planned on doing 90 meetings in 90 days and uh, just keep up with, like I plan to do. Uh, see, one of the things that happens with me is I isolate and then I start to not do well, so I plan to and do the Thanksgiving thing, keep up with my friends, clean, clean my apartment, tell my parents. Those are my plans. I have no plans to leave town. 
this is, I've done this, and I'm ready to face it, but I would love to go over it. I think that's going to happen. Bless you. Okay. I think that's going to happen. As I said at the very, very beginning of this, whatever time we started ago, hours ago, um, you're not under arrest right now. Okay. Okay, but as you can imagine, Call you back in 30 minutes. That was my cousin. Gotcha. Um, as I said at the beginning, you're not under arrest. Okay. But as you can imagine, an investigation be. like this yeah. is something that we've never dealt with. It's something okay. that doesn't happen very often. It's okay. something that you rarely hear about. Right. Okay? I don't know of many, but you're not the first person to do this. Right. Okay? Having said that, we have a responsibility to protect the public. Right. Right? You know where I'm coming from when I say that? Yes, absolutely. As a police. Okay. Absolutely. You've done some some things to some innocent people. Absolutely. Some pretty what people are Horrible gonna things. people are gonna have opinions of you and people Monster. are gonna Right. Exactly. Um, having said that, there's something in the criminal court of Canada and this this is usually Result in someone being charged with a criminal offense and being placed on such a thing called an 810 peace bond. Okay. okay. And basically, what an 810 peace bond is 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 kind of a promise given by your or your word given to us, and it's a, a court document that's issued by a judge that puts you on certain conditions to uh, certain conditions limiting you from doing certain things, having certain things in your possession, attending certain locations. And if you were to breach those conditions, right. then you would be arrested and further charged with okay. breaching this, what's called an 810 peace bond. Okay. So basically, would you be willing to enter into an 810 peace bond prior to being criminally charged? Absolutely. Okay. And Absolutely. do you understand what I mean by the 810 peace bond? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It means I have to do it or I come back and I'm in jail until everything else happens. I don't know what would happen if, if you were to breach it as far as jail and, and the consequences. Yeah. The only thing that I want to make sure that it's clear to you and, and that I'm make sure that I'm getting my point across is that it's basically a document that you're going to swear to uh, sign and uh, and uh, agree not to yeah. do certain things, not to have certain things in your possession. And right. I, and I'm saying I'm not saying that's going to happen right now. Okay. Because it has to go in front of a judge. Oh, okay. Okay. So it it's just an option that we're looking at because. After this interrogation, on October 25th, Elizabeth would be formally charged with eight counts of murder. In January of 2017, an additional six charges consisting of four counts of attempted murder and two counts of aggravated assault were added to the total. During her trial, on June 1st, Elizabeth would waive her right to a hearing and plead guilty to all charges. As a result, she would be stripped of her nursing license and registration indefinitely, and was ultimately sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences, with the possibility of parole after 25 years. She would be 75 years old when she is first eligible for parole. The sentence may not fit the crime, but hopefully it is enough for the victim's families. The surprise of finding out your loved one was actually murdered by their own caretaker did affect a lot of the families of the victims in this case. Many of the victims' families made remarks at Elizabeth's hearing and sentencing. Not only did they speak on behalf of their deceased loved ones, but they also spoke to how these horrific acts affected them in their relationships and lives at home. Hopefully, they can find peace in finally knowing what did happen to their deceased loved ones. In conclusion, I would love to show you the names of the lives lost at the hands of Wetlaufer. Rest in peace to those who were taken.